Welcome everyone. Uh, this is a slight continuation, I would say, of the ICO talk that Andre had uh, just one hour ago in the in the next room. Um, I would. Can you hear everything? Everything's fine. Working well. Okay. Uh, before I jump into the topic, uh, I'd like just to see your hands raised if you know what an ICO is. Please raise your Okay. <laughs> so no big explanations needed, which is great. And we will jump right into uh, the topic of today, ICOs. Um, uh, does it work as a modern way uh, or demo democratic way to raise money? Uh, is ICO a scam? Uh, everyone a scam or not? I believe Tone has his answers ready. Um, I will just shortly introduce myself, and then I will ask everyone to introduce himself uh, a little bit and uh, say, like, maybe his first um, statement on is ICOs scam? Uh, is it good? Is it not? And we'll take it from there. Uh, my name is Alena Vranova. I'm in the Bitcoin space since 2010. I co founded uh, Satoshi Labs and Trezor. Uh, in 2013, and I'm like a huge uh, fan of uh, cryptocurrencies. Personally, uh, I was very skeptical about ICOs at the beginning, and I was like, nah, maybe not really. Uh, but then I, you know, started to reevaluate, uh, and uh, today I think that if it's done well and has some solid team and solid idea and actually is solving some problem, it may be a much better way to to fast forward um, the team and the project than the current way of standard VC money funding and so on. Um, here's Pablo Coirolo. I'm handing over to him. Okay. Hello. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Pablo Coirolo. Um, I'm originally from Uruguay, South America. Um, I was CEO of Telefonica for Uruguay, so I come from the corporate world. And uh, I spend in M&A and VC for 10, 15 years in Latin America. And then I headed to Europe, uh, to Germany. And that's where, in 2014, I entered the space, the Bitcoin space. Uh, I'm one of those that started in 92 with the internet and had that, oh my God, experience. Uh, and my, my take on ICOs is, I think this is an incredible opportunity in time for entrepreneurs to realize their visions. And this is the way to fund it. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tone Vase. I come from the traditional finance environment. I got very interested in Bitcoin in um, early 2013. Uh, that brought me into the space. Uh, but I've always been critical of ICOs from day one, starting with Ethereum, which was an ICO. Uh, I, for multiple reasons, I'm sure we're going to get into them. It, it's hard to even summarize, but um, yes, there are lots of good ideas, but everyone thinks that their idea deserves you know, tens of millions of dollars to be funded, which isn't true. And um, the world has had over a hundred years of laws that were specifically designed from strangers soliciting money from other strangers. And uh, ICOs have created a platform where all of that is now thrown out the window. And uh, we can talk about you know, whether the projects themselves are good or not, that's debatable. But I don't think that a solution to, well, we don't like it that the governments get to print money, so the solution is everyone in this room and everyone around the world now gets to print their own money or their own security with promises uh, of that the RCO would do something with no one checking over whether they're going to do it or not. My name is Andre Pilny. Uh, I come from the Czech Republic. I, I would say I'm the one, youngest one, so I don't remember when the internet started. I was probably still a very small baby. And uh, last year uh, I co-founded ICO Index, which is a ICO tracking website. We do due diligence of ICOs and we try to distinguish between the scam ICOs, the junk one, the junk ICOs, and, the, and then the rest, the legit ones. And my take on ICOs, I think there are a lot of great projects that uh, can re revolutionize the world and they can re disrupt the traditional industries. And I think a lot of these ICO projects, they, 
they they have they have a chance they have a stand to chance, but the problem is that nowadays in 2017, there are so many ICOs that they don't understand the tokenization model. They don't understand why they should have a token, and they raise money for projects that shouldn't get funded through an ICO, but rather as a startup. So I think there are a lot of chunks and a lot of scams, but still there are few that are very interesting. Now, do you think because you know, since I'm in the Bitcoin space for a few years, and um, there has always been these tendencies like, yeah, it's going to be regulated, uh, it's going to be banned, and so on. And uh, some people that have lost bitcoins because of uh, you know some bad services and hacks and scams in the space. They've been calling for regulation, right? And so my question to you is, do you think we need uh, regulation uh, at all? Uh, what kind of regulation, if you think so? And Tony's ready to answer, so I'm... I'll, I'll, I'll start quite. It's not, it, it's not about whether we need regulation. Uh, the regulation is there. I mean, there's plenty of regulation that, uh, that's around who you can get money from for your project. Now, if you don't like the current regulation, you can try and you know change those that regulation scheme. Uh, but the regulation has always been there. The difference between Bitcoin and ICOs, Bitcoin is actually decentralized. Um, ICOs are not. Uh, it's like one guy, and the more popular and the more famous the guy, the more money he will raise from unqualified investors. So there is nothing decentralized. There is nothing. There's no innovation in the ICO itself, other than it's built on top of Ethereum, which is its own ICO. And now people are building ICOs on top of Ethereum to build ICOs on top of their ICOs, and it becomes a giant house of cards. Um, like the regulation is there. If you don't like the regulation, you got to try and change it. Uh, now it's different than money, which is what Bitcoin is. Uh, there was. Uh, I always say the governments can easily make Bitcoin useless, just eliminate all laws on money laundering and allow people to use their money freely. And then the only use case Bitcoin has is it's a deflationary currency instead of an inflationary currency. And we'll see if that's better or not economically. Hopefully, I'm assuming it's better. I hope it's better, but yet to be proven. And um, But yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it on that because it's not that we need new regulation on ICOs. The regulation is there. And uh, people are just getting around it by getting unqualified investors, which I don't think is a good thing. Um, I have a different take on that. Um, we've had 400 years of regulation everywhere. None of this has stopped a guy named Maddock uh, from scamming 56, $65 billion. That's almost the market cap of Bitcoin. Bitcoin today is 76 billion, I think, there if you check. Uh, and one, one single guy in a very regulated market with uh, complaints of the SEC telling them from five, six years before the crash, telling them that, look, this is, this is a scam. And we still got scammed. So the question is, do you stop innovation because they are scammers? Or do you promote for different entrepreneurs to actually realize their ideas? Because there's also other things. Everybody says, yes, we have a VC market, and I've been there. Uh, and 80% of the companies that are funded by VCs fail. So we need to separate what are scams and what is the normal business process. I don't think that additional regulation is going to stop the scams. What I do think is that this is a unique opportunity in time where entrepreneurs are able to raise capital and raise and, and be able to realize their ideas without the intervention of the VCs. And last year, VCs raised, uh, I believe in the States, something like 56 billion. And we've already raised $1.2 billion in the space. And the idea that you know we're here to protect grandma, 
there's no grandma investing in ICOs. And if no, somebody yeah. says that... Maybe uh, in Korea. Maybe. Not even in Korea. So I think that we, uh, you know, we really have to do a reality check and say, where are we? What will we obtain by over-regulating this, something that's just really new? And this is, uh, I mean, we're in the initial baby phases of this. Everybody's taking this that, like this is the stock market. The stock market does $5 trillion a day. So I, I think we, we have to spawn innovation and let this grow. And yes, I think uh, things like yours are interesting because what they do is they help people discern between scams and not scams. How do you do that? I just want to reply to that real okay. quick. Uh, about Bernie Madoff, well, you're right. Uh, Bernie Madoff was bad, and the SEC didn't do anything about it, and nobody really did. But it's still one guy. Uh, the ICOs allow everyone in this room to become Bernie Madoff, right? Um, and also, Bernie Madoff didn't affect any one of you. It didn't affect, uh, it almost didn't affect anyone. He actually you know, scammed rich people. And rich people have the capacity to get scammed because they have extra money. You said it yourself, 80% of the companies that VCs invest in fail. And VCs have a job to pick out potentially good ideas. And this is their specialty, and they are wrong 80% of the time. And this idea that, well, if you let anyone invest that isn't qualified at all to select, and who we, we think the qualified people are wrong 80% of the time, what do you think the success rate would be of unqualified people of investing in these companies? My view is VCs lose money. VCs do not make money. This idea that the rich get to get richer by investing in VCs, I don't believe that is true. I think if you, were, if you got rich at like 30 years old and you put a bunch of extra money, give it to VCs to invest in startups, by the time you're a senior citizen, you're going to realize they've lost you more money than they've made you. It's just fun to sit at the poker table with your other rich parties and say, yeah, I invested in Airbnb. You're not going to tell that guy that over your lifetime you've actually lost money than you gained. And this is, the, this is why you expect qualified investors, those with money, those that are supposed to be college educated, a little bit smarter than the average guy, to invest the money that they've earned from their other ventures in speculative ventures. Mm. Andre, do you think there's a way uh, people can actually become qualified without being the qualified according to SEC, but qualified in terms of being well informed to to take decisions? How would you do that? Okay, so and first of all, I would like to comment on on the first on, on the regulation. So. As Stone said, like there is a regulation already, but the thing is that these projects, ICR projects, they, they didn't realize that the regulation applies to them as well. So they thought that they can actually ignore the regulation and now SEC, China, Korea, they are all kind of saying they are, that ICUs are banned. So now they, they have to pay like uh, the lawyers to actually advise them where do they stand because the regulation is unclear. On Monday, I was in Vienna on Token Regulation Summit, and it seems to me that most of the regulators, they don't know how to regulate ICOs because they, didn't, they don't realize that they cannot stop transactions on the blockchain. They, they, they don't realize that they cannot track from which country it comes because people can use VPNs. So you don't know where, from where the, the, the money actually comes from. So the regu regulators, especially in European Union, I think they are still kind of looking at it and they will they will see what they are, what they can do with it and i think regulations uh, make sense in some way but i'm i'm pretty scared that if uh, european union will go from outside without understanding the technology they can actually hurt it and they can hurt the in innovation because what i see as a threat for investors are are scams and scams are usually th those projects that they can pay the best lawyers Take for example one coin, the biggest scam at all, like in in the whole crypt. It's not a crypto, of course, but the whole the, the worst scam. They can pay the best lawyers to actually take them out, and they are still not in jail. The worst scams, they don't pay developers. They they pay the lawyers, and they still get around. So these regulations are still not as as effective as they should be 
to get get down these scams. <laughs> and what they do is they actually hurt the innovation and all these startups they are legit. They need to hire lawyers as well, and they need to spend a lot of money because they don't understand the regulation. So they, for example, 10x is one of the most interesting ICOs. They had to pay 100k, 100,000 dollars for their legal advisors, and for a startup, that's a lot of money. 100,000, they can use it for, for to pay one developer, a developer for a year. So I think regulations should should be a regulator should be observing the space but shouldn't, shouldn't be stepping now. Mm -hmm. And what we have in the community, we have a self-regulation. So now you can see a lot of ICOs, what they do is they self-regulate. What they do is they take steps further. They, they go beyond the, the regulation and they do things to, to provide investors transparency. So they, for example, they try to be transparent as much as they can. They, they give the investors all the information they need and they, they, they do KYC or regulation even though they don't know if they should. So what they do is they self-regulate themselves because they don't know the rules. So I um, think this is effective. Can, can I ask a question? So um, which I see, so um, in the, let's say the top 20, the top 20 by market cap, which of those ICOs do you, did, did, did your website consider scams? And which ones is, are not that are in the top 20 or are they all legit in the top 20? From the top 20? Uh, anything off the top of your head? Yeah, from the top 20, there is one scam that I'm sure it's a scam. It's a Ponzi scheme. It's called BitConnect coin. It's a, it's a, it's a just Ponzi scheme. It works as a Ponzi scheme. It looks like a Ponzi scheme. And, it is a Ponzi scheme. Anything else that did not pass your radar in the top 20? Um, there are definitely some. Or close enough to the top 20. Uh, do you mean like a, as a scam or not? As a, as a scam, and then we'll talk about like two examples that aren't. Um, I would need to check because these top twenty changes quite often. Right, right. Like in the vicinity, in a, something people heard of is okay, what I'm, is where I'm going. Wrote, it is a scam. Yes. Which one? So the Bitcoin? besides Bitconnect, um, I think one was called. LAT, I think someone mentioned it in, in the presentation before, LAT token or something like that. Okay, so which ones do you think are legit, legit. ICOs? Ethereum. You think Ethereum is legit? Okay, yes, anything like not as popular as okay. Ethereum you think is legit? Okay, list. Because, uh, list. because for me to argue Ethereum is yeah. very, um, com is, is, is a long conversation. Okay, so, so for example, Lisk. Lisk, is this the loaning thing? Pardon? Is that the loans? Lisk. No, 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 no. Which it's, one is that? it's a. I would say, from a basic perspective, it's similar to Ethereum, but with I'm the difference salt. that okay. they use JavaScript, or the, the developers can use JavaScript okay. to develop on top of their... All right, so I'll, I'll briefly mention Ethereum and why I don't like Ethereum and why I've always been skeptical of Ethereum from day one. I'll, I'll make it quick. I have four points on Ethereum. You have one minute. What, what, sure. What, one is regulatory. I think they broke uh, all of the laws on securities by creating a token that didn't even exist a year in advance as an investment vehicle. Uh, the second one I think is technological. I don't think the blockchain can scale. Uh, it's uh, I don't know anyone that's able to maintain the whole blockchain. Uh, the third one is functional. I don't believe contracts need to be decentralized because no one is censoring your smart contract. And the last one is economic. I think it's completely crazy to create an app token. I don't recall Amazon charging Amazon stock for their products or Netflix charging Netflix stock for their products. But Ethereum has an idea that you have to create your own currency slash security in order to pay for a smart contract, assuming smart contracts are even needed to be decentralized. Do you... Yes, I mean, um, I think we're done today. <laughs> Um, now let's look more a little bit into the the you know ways to explain and to approach tokens from the regulatory perspective. Um, there is basically a, a lot of uncertainty in this field, uh, especially in European Union. USA is taking some steps. Uh, they issued uh, certain like um, guidelines. Now there is the SAFT project, which uh, basically builds on a simple 
agreement for future tokens, which would be a um, kind of like um, framework allowing you to raise money, give nothing back, and then basically give a promise that once we launch our system that has some uh, coin inside, you will get those coins or those tokens. Um, and so regulators basically distinguish also the, those that I spoke with distinguish between a utility-based token, something that you need in order to use that system, or some equity-based token, so which is basically a promise of future revenues or some uh, profits uh, bound with uh, with these tokens. Now. Um, where do we go from here? I mean, how can you even know upfront where the where the project ends up, uh, where the promises are, and where it ends up in the future? So now today I will create SAFT uh, agreement, uh, and I will say in one year's time I will launch this product, uh, and then you will be able to use the token. Uh, but in the meantime, my token that I give, for example, in advance as a representation of the crowdfunding um, support, uh, starts to get uh, traded. And now we run into issues with, with regulators, especially the US regulator SEC, uh, because once you have some uh, token that you claim to be um, to be a utility token and then the utility token is openly traded, then it's more like an equity or an asset, right? So what's your take on this? Um, um, this is very interesting because I, I've been with both the Liechtenstein and the Swiss regulators. Uh, speak Not the regulators, I've spoken with uh, the lawyers in Switzerland and the regulator in Liechtenstein. And basically what, what's really happening here is there's a lot of people who have really good ideas. And there's a lot of people who are scammers, and, and I, again, uh, I, I, in this, in the future, and if today we're, you know, tomorrow is the year 2,575, we're going to be talking about somebody scammed somebody. So I, I think that, 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 you know, there's a really good book that says 400 years of scam that I was talking about, that, that, that is going to happen. But we need to be able to separate this. And, and in terms of the token and the utility token, a lot of these ICOs, basically what's happening is, how can we make our token not a security? And that's the discussion of why they've come up with, oh, it's a utility. And then they try to find a way for this token to work in their economy. Uh, just so they're not regulated by the SEC. Uh, and again, everybody's scared of the SEC. It's not any of the other regulators. Uh, it's the SEC. And is the SEC going to come after you? So basically, all these things, the SAFT, the utility tokens, are trying to not be regulated by the SEC. So what I think is there are ideas out there that actually use the token as a utility that's used in the system that that they have the idea of how the economics works. And this is based on business models. I think in your talk the other day, somebody, somebody uh, the other, this, hour. Uh, the other hour, I'm already a different time zone. Um, they were saying, what is the business model? I mean, I come from the business model world and I always look at Okay, is this going to make sense in the future? Is this going to be an Amazon? But today, we're in the infrastructure part of this whole internet. We're at the base. Uh, we're not, we're not at, you know, we're comparing the internet with this new technology and new economy. And they're in 100 years difference between one and the other. It's just that the speed of change that we're having is so great that in eight years, we've gone from no Bitcoin, you know, 10 years now, eight, no Bitcoin to now it's the whole economy and we're all sitting talking about it. So I think that there are tokens that are going to be utility tokens and are really used. And I think that's the ICOs that are going to raise the money, raise the projects. And with luck, they will be successful if 
the people find what they're doing really useful? Well, I already brushed on this with the Ethereum example, so this will be quick on my part. Uh, I have not seen a single project with a utility token that made sense. Uh, they don't make sense to me at all. Uh, again, the only reason to have a utility token, uh, other than Bitcoin, because Bitcoin needed a utility token for censorship-resistant value transfer. Um, besides that, and copycats of Bitcoin, like Litecoin and uh, Monero, they obviously, they're trying to be value transfer. So obviously they need a, their own token. Other than that, when it comes to these ICOs and platforms, even Ethereum and everything else, um, I don't, the utility token doesn't make sense to me at all. That's just a way for them to create money. Now, um, if you're using the concept of a utility token to get around securities laws, good luck. Because the moment that token is, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, some regulator is going to call you out for having a duck. Uh, so just saying it's a security token, no matter how many lawyers you have, it, that, that doesn't matter. If they determine that it's being used as a security, it was a security. It doesn't matter what you thought it was, it's how, being, it's how it gets used. Um, so when you have a utility token, you have this little spectrum. Scam here, a silly idea for having a utility token to begin with and the other. Where you are in the spectrum is up to you. I've made it clear you should not have a utility token, so I'm putting you towards the scam side from the beginning. Um, so that's kind of my view on it. If you have to raise money, then raise money. Give up equity, uh, give up whatever, give up debt uh, to your company to pay out from future revenue, um, and go after qualified investors, because right now 12 and 13 year olds are investing in your ICOs, and then reselling them to people all over the world. So I think that a lot of ICOs, they are issuing just a utility token. They don't give other additional features as revenue sharing or equity because they would be considered to be securities. So because they are scared of these regulators, they try to take everything out and keep just the utility because SEC, SEC said that if it's just a utility token, if it's close to a voucher, then it's not a security. So all these ICOs, they are trying to not have a revenue sharing, not have equity. And that's why now they, we have so many utility tokens opposed to other projects. And I think that a lot of, proje a lot of projects don't need tokens. As you said, I think it's completely correct. They, from technological perspective, the tokens in most of the cases don't, doesn't make sense at all. But in some cases, it is essential. The token is essential from the game theory perspective how to incentivize people to participate in your platform, how to incentivize developers, how to incentivize other people to create something on your platform. And if you have this token, then you can pay these people to, in tokens, not in money, and then they will start developing, they will start contributing to your platform. And from, from crowdfunding, you have also crowdsourcing because you crowdsource all the people around in the community that they get the tokens. And I think the tokens are not just from technological perspective important, but from the game theory are important in a lot of projects. Just one more quick comment. I mean, there are utility tokens in the world today, but they're all pegged to something like a casino has a utility token, right? You walk into a casino and you buy the casino chips, but they're pegged to the local currency of the jurisdiction of that casino. Um, airline miles kind of work the same way. Uh, but if even if we think of the most, um, people think is the most useful utility token being Ethereum. Um, if the world needs decentralized smart contracts, it will be done on Bitcoin, which is a much more secure, more stable blockchain with a much less volatile uh, currency, uh, the, the Bitcoin over Ethereum. Like they're, they're just not needed. I think we are running out of time uh, shortly, uh, but I would I would use the, the time that remains for allowing you to to yeah raise your hands, and I'll probably distribute the mic. Hope it's on. Try, please. Uh, just a quick one for Tony because I just want to. Uh, Carly, did you say that it's okay to steal from rich? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's what I, you know, in this country, there was I, a regime, I, I, which, I didn't oh, sorry, say, sorry, in this country, there was an attempt to build a regime around that, it didn't really bend very well. I, 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 I didn't, I, I didn't say it's okay, um, I didn't say it's okay to steal from rich, but um, in the case of Bernie Madoff, Bernie Madoff ran a hedge fund. 
A hedge fund is a speculative vehicle designed for the rich because it's very speculative. So you expect the rich people investing in that hedge fund to have the resources to do the proper due diligence. And it's unfortunate that it wasn't done, but at least the people that he scammed had the resources to do proper due diligence as opposed to people with, uh, with only you know $1,000 to their name investing in even more speculative things. Yeah, but don't don't you think like today we are talking about the democratic access to to financing? But when in reality you look at the the way ICOs work, you always have some certain limits to enter, and those limits are five or ten thousand dollars just to start. Yeah, and th then, there's a reason for that. Yes. And then and then most of the ICOs have pre-funding secured, so that means they talk to VCs, they talk to big whales. And when they, you know, open the ICO and they want to raise like 200 million, all of a sudden they have 50 million already. Right. Yeah. We, we didn't even talk so, about the whole pre-ICO concept where you hand out a bunch of tokens to your friends and influential people for free or very, very cheap. You have them pump them up, hype them up, and then you sell it to the crowd. The initial investors get out at the top uh, and not the top, but early on. And then the people that bought it first think they can just sell it and get more money. I mean, again, this is the kind of stuff that regulation attempted to eliminate. I'm not saying they did a great job, but um, it was better than nothing in that regard. And um, one more thing to say, I already forgot, so I'll move on. No, but are, we, are they really then scamming the normal small people? Or is it not really the case. And then also the money that flows in, is it really the money that it looks like optically? Because those people who are investing now into ICOs probably jumped into Ethereum very early on. So the, 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 their real investment into that, and the, those may have been early Bitcoiners as well. So in reality, when someone invests a million, it may have been um, a thousand or 5,000 in the beginning, right? So. Is it really the case that we're scamming poor, poor normal people here, or uh, are those people actually informed and actually know the risk that's out there? It's very interesting because I was listening to you say the things about the ICO, and I, I swear I heard IPO, because that's exactly what the IPOs do. Uh, they, they, the guys who get the stock beforehand, our friends, their family, they they their big funds, working at the big funds, they get that. And as soon as that IPO, the ring, bell rings, uh, they get out and they cash out and they make a lot of money and it's a small group of people. So, I mean, I just want to make clear, I'm not against regulation. What I am against is Every, every circle is including the same people. And, you know, I'm not against rich people. No, I'm not. Uh, but it, it, they make the game for themselves. This is the first time that they can't play in the game or they don't understand how somebody else is controlling the game and it's not them. And, and that's what I'm saying is happening in terms of the ICO market. I disagree that that's how IPOs work today, but uh, we'll get to the next question. I got permission to interrupt you guys. Um, I would, I'd still like to go back to these utility tokens, and, and maybe you can pick one that's not Ethereum, because that's really complicated, because it's a currency as well. Like, pick one well, of these. They all are. Every utility token yeah, exactly. can also be a currency. But, but some of you believe that there might be useful utility tokens. Maybe you can pick one and talk about how it would be useful and how the economy would develop there. I'm also quite skeptical, but I'd like to be proven. Maybe wrong. Andre is the right guy to answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> or, or okay, so, so the question is, uh, like, how do these tokens work, or what is their well, usage? Which one do you think is useful, and, and how would that economy develop, and why would they use that token, not just Bitcoin or some other yeah. currency? Can I just clarify, like, a utility token outside of the Ethereum business model, which is a token to build more tokens on top of it. So is there a utility token that that isn't used to build more utility tokens? <laughs> That's a very good question. I would say we are still in the early days. 
So, like, I would say there are a lot of tokens that they, they kind of say they are utility tokens, but their utility value is still very low because the projects are, I would say most of the ICO projects, they are still in the development phase. So as soon as they come out from the development phase, when they actually develop the platform, and the tokens will be used on their platform, then the utility value will, will increase. And now, like, there is a utility value, and then there is, like, the, the speculator's price, because... If you see the prices of tokens, this is not the utility value. This is speculation. So a lot, I would say most of these tokens, they are raised in value, big, not because they are useful, but because of speculations. So I would say the speculation increases the price at the moment. And the utility value is very low for most of the projects because they are still not developed. That's completely correct. I just want to say one thing. So in the traditional VC model, the VC invests money for equity, and it's their job to make sure that whatever was promised is being developed. Is there anyone holding the ICO issuers accountable for whatever it is they're doing with the money that they have raised? No. And what's the actual liability in the VC world? I'm a startup. I get to my millions of dollars funding. I fail. What's my what's my liability? You don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. No one knows <laughs> because Zero. those ICOs that failed, they kind of like disappeared, and they just vanished. They vanished from the yeah. exchanges, and people forgot yeah. about them. Yeah. Your, your liability is that the SEC will get you like they did with Josh Garza and Paycoin and not like Big Vern that was able to cash out millions through Coinbase and run away. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, now you're, again, you're, you're back to relying on the, uh, on the government to catch these people because no one here is going to. Okay, next question here, please. Yeah. I, I'm sure. not very big on governments, you know, catching people because if you see most of the people that they catch are really not the big scammers. Uh, they'll catch one and make them as an example, but you have an, you know, an Enron where how many people are 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 in jail for Enron? Um, yeah. I, 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 I think they're still in jail actually, uh, but. Uh, uh, but just my view on regulation, look, I, I, I love Bitcoin. I believe in Bitcoin. I think a person should have the ability to um, spend money any way that they like. But the things that they're spending their money on need to somehow be checked that they're somewhat legit. So I'm against all know your customer laws. I'm against all money laundering laws. Uh, but yeah, if you're going to solicit money from strangers that aren't your friends, uh, aren't your family and close friends, there has to be some form of regulation. You can't just a a get money from strangers randomly. Uh, but I think that once you have money, uh, that money should never be criminalized. Okay, please, let's give space to our audience. So I'd like to pose a question specifically to Tone, being the ICO skeptic. So if you think about, um, if you think about the value proposition of uh, Bitcoin, there might be two interesting aspects here. So if you think about... Uh, privacy, control, and uncensorable financial transactions. Uh, we don't really have many opportunities to invest in other kinds of financial assets that are bearer financial assets. We used to have bearer bonds and all these kinds of things. All these things are pretty well pretty well tracked by the DTCC, I believe, in the United uh, United States and the SEC. Um, and certainly, there's opportunity to to censor me and my financial assets. So uh, that's one aspect. The second aspect is what Bitcoin offers really well is known verifiable scarcity. Now, I'm not sure the extent of the problem in in the current financial system, but I do know that there are quite a few cases where all of a sudden, you know, Walmart was supposed to issue 10,000 bonds, and in fact, there are 11,000 floating around uh, somewhere. So I'd like to know if you think that specifically on top of Bitcoin, uh, ICOs in some kind of form might might be a useful value proposition. I, I'm not sure about that very last part, but uh, I, I may have to think about that one. But the very first part you mentioned, this is why I don't have a single like dollar in anything outside of Bitcoin. Uh, this is why I think Bitcoin will be the only 
one that succeeds. This is why I think there will be only one blockchain, like we only have one internet. And then everything else is just uses the internet, just like many things will use Bitcoin as the censorship resistant, unconfiscatable value transfer. And that's why I believe in Bitcoin, but everything else is just the reincarnation of everything tried before, only on top of Ethereum, which I don't think is going to last. So I would like to ask to the pro ICO part of the panel uh, again about utility token. Assuming that uh, this uh, that this platform do need a, a crypto token, let's assume that. Assume that this crypto token cannot be Bitcoin, as Stone said. Probably, if you need a crypto token to pay for the service, you just need to integrate Bitcoin. But assuming that is somehow infeasible or not possible, and it, this doesn't damage the project itself, creating more friction. Assuming that there is scarcity because in most in most cases uh, th there is not what is the reason why some somebody everybody should think that this utility token even if it makes sense and even if the project gets realized will increase in value so why do you think that people is investing in utility tokens because even if a utility token makes sense and the project is realized uh, the price of that the price of a service of the platform will not increase in time uh, I, I can buy the price, the, the service of the platform also later, and what I'm getting buying it before is just also discounting the risk that the platform doesn't get built. So there is no reason on earth why a utility token should go up. So isn't that people is buying utility token for anti-SEC purposes, but they are just thinking they are buying equity token in disguise. Uh, all the effort to this. To, to, to make a real utility token uh, is probably f uh, paired with an effort to let people think that they are buying the value of the project, a share of the project. So the final part of my question would be, well, why not instead just work on the real censorship resistant anti-regulation uh, equity token or security token. I mean, Bitcoin is, uh, is violating AML and KYC. Let's create some real uh, security token violating SEC completely in a censorship resistant way, well, it, anonymously, well, Satoshi-like. My very short answer is uh, you can't make money from that and no one will fund your project. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you have to separate the two, okay? Um, one thing is the project, and other is what the investors want from the project, okay? So there's two, right now in the beginning, we have speculation, you know? Uh, I asked an ICO that was successful, I said, you know, oh great, you raised all your funds. How much of your funds do you think were raised by true believers in what you were going to do? And they said 70%. And I was like, no, it's the other way around. There's only 30% who really believe that you're going to do something interesting. And there's 70% that want to go in and in at 1 and out at 10. Now, each one, the investors in that sense, they want to go in and out at 10. Now, is that wrong? Is every investor in stock uh, of Apple have Apple equipment? You know, so, so the thing here is if you are doing an ICO and you really have an idea that you think will change the world because everybody is going to change the world, okay? And the, the only people that really change the world, and paraphrasing Apple here a little, is, is the people who try. And if what we're trying to do is stop those people who try, because we say all of them are scammers, then we're stopping this innovation in this uh, initial moment. We are at the, at the birthplace of this. All of us in this room, yes, we know about Bitcoin, we know about blockchains, we have, go outside here, this room, and start talking to people, and they've heard of Bitcoin, but they have no clue of the rest, what's going on. The people who are investing in these ICOs are people who want to go in at one and out at 10, and have already done so. If you talk to some of the people who manage many ICOs, they say they have repeat customers. 
Uh, they, th because they went in at one, they came out at ten. Now they have ten. They go in at, uh, they go in with five. They go out at twenty. And boy, this for them is working. Most of the people don't even read the white papers, you know. And the thing is, let's do a reality check of what's really happening. That's the only thing that I'm saying. I definitely agree. We are now in the speculation phase. So many people are putting money into projects that they don't have a clue about what, what they are actually developing. You are definitely uh, absolutely right that uh, a lot of these tokens, now they don't have a utility value. They might have in the future. And they speculate only. Most of the people speculate that these tokens will have value somewhere in the future. We are in the same phase as we were in the dot-com bubble. Does someone remember Pets.com or have you heard about Pets.com company? Just a few people. So Pets.com was a, was a website that was selling dog, dogs and cats food to people over the internet. Great idea, right? Maybe it was yeah, 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 Amazon. Pardon? It's uh, Pets.com was Amazon before Amazon. Yeah, it was before Amazon, maybe, yeah. It, it, it was Amazon. That was actually a great idea. It, Amazon did it, but they just didn't know how to do it. Right. Yeah, they, yeah, they didn't know how to do it because it was too early. There were not not enough people on the on the internet to buy pets food. So, and and this company had like maybe hundreds of million of valuation. It was just speculation because people expected that once uh, the internet will be big, this company will also have a value. But they failed. So now we are in the ICO phase when it's just speculation. No one actually knows which of these tokens will be in the future useful. Just, just a few of them. Just, uh, I, I was talking about it in, in the presentation there next door, and I was saying that two percent of all the tokens could be actually useful. Maybe it's even less. I don't know. We are still in the speculation phase. As, as you said, most of the people they they participate in ICOs is just because of money. They want to speculate. They want to earn money from that. So now we are in speculation right. and, phase. And, and the idea is, Pets.com is Amazon. It's the same exact thing, and this is why. You know, you let qualified investors with money to lose invest in these things, and once one of them actually shows itself, um, it goes IPO officially because it's been vetted and it's legit and it has revenue, and then you can buy it. Everyone is mad at Facebook. Well, guess what? Facebook IPO'd at 40, it was overhyped. Within a month, it dropped to $20. Any one of you in this room could have bought Facebook stock at twenty dollars. Today, Facebook stock is like two fifty. Could have made ten percent. Could have made ten x on your money by buying Facebook after Facebook has beaten out, you know, dozens of other social media networks. But if you invested in every single social media network as a pre-IPO back in those days, you probably would have lost all your money because there's no way you would have picked Facebook. You probably would have picked MySpace. And this is why you let the qualified investors be speculators and you can buy it right after the IPO and still make good money. People are upset Facebook is making all the money on your content. You could have made 10 extra money. All you have to do is buy Facebook stock. It's still available right now today. And it's a legit company. Tell them, listen, it's, it's interesting. We have one minute. And I would like to give a chance to this lady here to give her question she's been waiting for. Uh, so um, anyway, we all know that most uh, tokens, shit coins we have now are chewing gum wrappers. They're not utility tokens. They're like collectibles, beads or shells. Uh, at the same time, I believe that it's a fundamental right to actually be able to print your own currency, right? So the question to the whole panel is, what is your dystopian scenario? Imagine there is no regulation, there's no ACC, there's nothing. And we just all allowed to print our own shitcoins. What is dystopian scenario? Is it like Chinese grannies launching their own ICOs? Like, what would it be the worst thing that can happen? Thanks. If uh, I mean, I'm not a big fan of everyone printing their own money. I think it's a complete disaster. No one would know what's valuable. Uh, this pro America had this problem in the 1930s when Andrew Jackson eliminated the second Federal Reserve Bank. And every bank started printing their own money. And no one on the other side of the country knew if the money was legit or fake. And the Secret Service was created as a primary means to separate you know, fake money from real money. It's still the primary objective but and protecting the president a second. The question is not fake money, like copies of other money, but your own money. And for example, Europe has a huge history of local currencies. Uh, that have had a specific purpose and they were valid in that 
Right, but time. they're very local currencies. But in this case, you want to export that. Like if you take some European village and you take their money outside of that village, everyone is going to look at it as monopoly money. No one is going to accept it. It's right. right but for the purpose and the space where it has been used, it, it was valid. It was not a scam. Right. Uh, I mean, I think uh, I, I agree. Everybody can print their money. It's not a question that you print the money. The question is, will the market accept it? And in the end, I think, is it going to be Bitcoin, which I think it is? Is it going to be something else that we don't even know about right now? Um, right now, everybody's thinking on Facebook, Amazon, whatever. We're not even there yet. We're at TCP IP. Uh, that's where we are. And, and, you know, everybody's thinking of the Amazon. That's going to be built on top of this infrastructure. Right now, we're at BitNet. I, I don't know if, well, most of you might remember BitNet, but that's where we are. And, and the thing is that we're trying to regulate Amazon when we're at TCP IP and connecting to routers. So I, I, I think the, if there's one thing that you take out from here, at least from my perspective, is think really where we are and think that if we stop this at this moment, there is going, there's not going to be innovation. There's not going to be this brave new world that everybody wants to create. Uh, just, just a closing thought. Uh, in the dot-com bubble, like 98 to 99 percent of all of those IPOs, they failed and they went to zero. Maybe there'll be one or two of these out of these thousands of ICOs. Maybe there'll be one or two of them that succeed. I'm skeptical that there even will be one or two. But suppose there is one or two. Uh, do you really think you're going to get that one right? Uh, That's what most people think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and those people will learn a valuable lesson. And what I don't like is all those people then run to the government for them to do something. Uh, everyone always says people should make their own decisions. I worked at Bear Stearns during the financial crisis. Uh, the whole bank went down. I mean, I was kind of lucky. I transitioned to JP Morgan. Most of the people didn't. I don't remember anyone taking responsibility for buying an overpriced house. Everyone blamed Wall Street and wanted everybody arrested. So. Um, that's kind of my view on things now. Yeah, m maybe it's like in the US, like like you explained, but I would say that in Europe, like the governments are not like in in such a way protecting like the people from from these things. Like I cannot imagine that like I would lose money. I know it's my mistake. I know I made a mistake. I wouldn't go somewhere to a government. I don't know what is he, what is your opinion, but I would definitely know to will not go to a government because I know that I'm taking a risk. What you are talking that most people. They will lose money, which is which is true, and I th I agree that they will learn a lesson, and in the future they will understand more because they know that. I don't think they're gonna learn their lesson because the Dow showed us that, right? <laughs> the, the the very first like, like when the Dow um, like dropped the price of Ethereum by like 50, 60 percent, 150 million was was um, I, I wouldn't even call it a hack. It was like a, you know someone actually read the code and took the money. And um, I was hoping people would learn their lesson, but then the Ethereum Foundation and Vitalik reversed the chain, gave people their money back, and hey, we just got a bailout. Nobody learned their lesson, and here we go. You know, maybe if they didn't reverse the chain, this wouldn't be that bad right now. Hmm. Okay, I I will have to close this. I'm very sorry. Maybe I will just say one more like final thought from myself. Uh, we are all striving for personal freedom. And freedom comes with responsibility. Uh, so I believe like it's our chance to start, you know, stop, you know, asking to be babysit uh, by the governments and by the authorities and just start to learn. And sometimes those lessons to learn will be hard. But I think those are necessary. And I prefer and I choose freedom over being regulated and, and babysit. That's just my personal. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.